Mr. Moore, uh, Mr. Mr. Covey, Mr. Gardner. Present. Mr. Gardner's here. No, that's Danny. Okay, okay, not not Gardner. Mr. Hawkins, <clears throat> Mr. Holly, and Mr. Munson. Here. We already know. Who who just said here? Holly. Holly. Yeah. Okay, so we've got Moore, Covey, and Holly as official board members that are present. In addition, um, Mr. Challenger. I'm here. Um, Miss Terry. Here. Um, Mr. Glover. Miss Wright. Here. Okay. Um, and and then me, Patty Phillips. And is there anyone I missed? Okay. And um, I think that we can. Uh, Landon, you can take it from here in terms of. Uh, well, we I guess we're not going to vote on the minutes, so we can yeah, go we'll straight to. That. Yeah, to the next agenda item. And um, that is, I believe, I'm not looking at it. Is the fund the, flows. Yes, and let me just go over that quickly for you. Um, we started in July 1st <clears throat> at $211,534,750.50. And uh, of the two months of this fiscal year, uh, there has been 4 million eight hundred twenty nine thousand five hundred eight dollars paid out in benefits the city has contributed uh, about two point seven million there have been unrealized gains of the seventeen point seventeen eight six zero seven sixty for a balance at the end of August of two hundred twenty seven million one hundred eighty one thousand one hundred and twenty dollars and seventy one cents <throat> So we're early in the year, but um, when Brian or, or uh, comments on the market, you, he can comment on the, the great uh, returns. Who did I just hear? I just nobody's joined us additionally, right? I don't believe so. I don't think okay. so. Yeah, now, Jim Whitney's uh, here. The um, then if there's are there any questions? And the next item was the VML Vaco account, and that balance at the end of uh, August is four million six fifty nine five hundred forty three dollars and thirty one cents. And I thought perhaps uh, Mr. Holly would like to comment on the annual meeting, virtual annual meeting he attended um, for this oh, yeah. organization. Be happy to real fast because we've got a lot to cover today. Uh, September 25th, we had a virtual meeting that I attended. Uh, it was very interesting. Um, uh, there was a presentation by Lucas uh, Detour, who is managing director of Carvel Investors, uh, which is a management team that is involved with Portfolio One. Uh, he talked about uh, their their main thrust was buying corporate debt, uh, bad corporate debt and bad loans, restructuring them and, and selling them back to the marketplace. Uh, that was a pretty interesting uh, conversation. Uh, they also do the same with solar roofing. That's become a, a huge business where they buy the mortgages for solar roofing and repackage them and, and sell them back to the market. And in the airline industry, particularly the smaller airlines, with uh, the virus and, and the airlines going out of business, they will buy bankrupt uh, um, airlines, restructure, and uh, sell back to the market. So that was pretty interesting. Uh, they also talked about two different portfolios, which, uh, if you recall, Landon discussed that last year, and it was pretty interesting to to go back and review it again. Uh, portfolio two, there's a lot of fixed income. And portfolio one, there are uh, more equities. Uh, 
portfolio two is for the for the shorter term portfolio one is for the longer term and the portfolios are designed for a 20 to 30 year time span uh, interesting enough that over the last year portfolio two which is more targeted to fixed income uh, did better than portfolio one so uh, in a in a nutshell that's what it was about it lasted the meeting lasted a couple of hours and it was pretty interesting any questions okay just uh one general question um i think if i remember correctly we're in portfolio one is that right are you asking me that anyone that knows i, I don't know has, i think we're in one um but yes, I, yes, I can't you are, yes, you are yes which which is the slightly higher equity i think if i remember correctly uh correctly one is like 70 30 roughly and the other one's like 60 40 or something like that i think so yes <clears throat> uh did you ha um do you have any sort of uh comments on the performance did they cover that and is are the funds still holding up well um in the near term the recent um, no they didn't they didn't get specific about the rates of returns uh over the last they did say over the last year as i mentioned portfolio two did better than portfolio one uh over the last five to ten years Portfolio two was about one and a half percent higher than portfolio one. So um, that has a lot to do with uh, being in a fixed income over the past year anyway. Um, but but not, nothing concerning, I guess, from your point. I did. I did not know. I'm, I'm not real concerned about it at all. Uh, they fairly good job managing the, uh, the, the whole process. Okay. All right. Thanks. Welcome. All right. Yeah, so I think with that, Landon, it's new business. I just stopped sharing my screen, so I'm going to allow Andre to take it. Yep, we got, uh, yep, Andre on the actuarial update all right great thanks landon can everyone see my screen i'm starting for those of you that have the presentation i'm starting on slide four history of retirement systems and benefits summary so good morning uh good to see those of you who i can see on the uh the brady bunch like screen uh, hopefully we'll be able to do this in person next year uh, but this will suffice for now so as per usual, we'll just start with an overview of the the retirement plans provisions and really their benefits. Um, so the systems, each of them began in the 1950s. Subsequent to that, participation was frozen in 1984 <laughs> for the supplemental system, 1995 for the fire and police, meaning that any employees that were hired subsequent to th those dates do not participate in the systems. As we see at the bottom, benefits are provided in connection with three events in particular, upon retirement, disability, as well as upon death. In the fire and police system, uh, participants are eligible or members are eligible for retirement after 20 years of service or a combination of five years of service uh, <coughs> along with attaining age 50. The benefits are based on the final average compensation, which is the 36 highest months consecutively of compensation, or the average of, of that amount. And uh, that amount is divided by 36 for a monthly compensation, then multiplied by a percentage. And that percentage is based on the number of years that the member has in the system 3% for the first 20 2% for the next five years and 1% over 25 years so a participant a member who has earned 30 years of service essentially will have a benefit equal to 75% of their final average compensation in addition to that any member who retires prior to 65 will have a supplemental benefit 
equal to $200 per month up until the age of 65. Under the supplemental system, retired members are eligible for retirement at age 50 with five years of service. The benefit again is based on the final average compensation. The factor, the service factor is different. Instead of it being graded from 3% down to one, it's a flat 2% for all years of service. Some of you may recall that the benefit was recalculated after 65. That, that uh, provision was amended out effective July 1, 2013. So the, ben the benefit is consistent before and after age 65. Similar to the fire and police system, there is a $200 supplemental benefit, monthly benefit that's payable until 65 if a member retires prior to 65. Any questions on the provisions? Okay, silence is golden. Moving before we turn it turn over to or before we get into the actual results, let's just review some of the definitions uh, of some of the terms that you will hear me use. Starting with the actuarial value of assets. So most of us are familiar with the market value of assets. That is the value that you would see if you were to open up your trust report. Um, but we use something that's referred to as the actuarial value of assets. That is a smooth value. It's designed to uh, produce a smooth value of assets and really uh, defers some of the gains and losses that the uh, that is yielded from an investment perspective. And the the hope is that it will produce a smoother pattern, not only of the assets, but of contribution requirements. So that's the assets on the liability side. We have the accru actuarial accrued liability, and that is the present value of benefits that have been accrued to date. So in theory, if you wanted to settle those, the benefits and relieve yourself of the liabilities, that's the amount that you would have to pay in theory. And the unfunded liability is the difference between those two measures, uh, the difference between the assets and the liabilities and the amount that you would have to pay to bring the assets up to the value of the benefits. Another way of looking at the difference between the assets and liabilities is dividing one by the other, and that's referred to as the funded status or the funded percentage. Then we have the actuarially determined contribution. You re may recall we used to refer to the contribution that I would calculate as the annual required contribution, but it really is the amount that we calculate on an annual basis that we assume or that we estimate will satisfy all benefits that are payable in the future. So these are the, the, these are the contributions that I'm calculating based on the liabilities in comparison to the assets along with another measure that I'll, I'll mention in a second, that we, um, based on this calculation, if these contributions are made on an annual basis, all of the benefits that are payable will be adequately funded. Hey, Andre, um, quick question. <clears throat> the actuarial value of assets, um, is that a choice that we made for accounting purposes that we choose to do the smoothing or we choose to do not the smoothing? Yeah, uh, that was chosen. Uh, I'm not sure how long ago it was before I started working with the organization, but it is quite common. Uh, and again, it's not <coughs> the, the, the purpose is to really just smooth out the pattern of contributions. It's not biased above or below the market value of assets. And that's the key to uh, this measure. Um, sometimes, and, and what we want to see is that sometimes the actual value of assets exceeds the market value, and at other times it's below the market value, and that's when you know it's it's truly not biased. Right. Um, so the the, the follow up to that is what is this only something that y'all use for this actuarial actuarial determined contribution? Is that I guess. This is probably a Patty or, or, or Mimi question. Do, do the rating agencies use AVA or do they use the market value, the, the current market value when they're looking at sort of the debt related to this um, uh, pension plan? 
I can jump in. My understanding is that they use the market value, but Patty or Mimi, you, you probably know better than I do. Yeah, no, and I'd, I'd wanted to add on to that, that um, you've done a separate calculation, a, a, a separate handout of the GASB requirements, I think 67 and 68. And if you really want to get crazy, um, Landon, look at that. Um, because it's not not quite so straightforward. <clears throat> the, well, the, the reason I, I the only reason I'm asking is like, what's I guess is there any benefit or 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 not for doing it that way? Is is it? Do you report? So you have what the rating agencies see. They use market value, which makes sense for them. On the sort of the city's balance sheet, do you put this AVA or do you put the market value? There's, uh, there's about three different calculations, and maybe, Andre, you can speak to it. Sure. So this calculation, Landon, that we're, we're using the actuarial value of assets is strictly for calculating the actuarially determined contribution, and it's very common amongst uh, non-ERISA or governmental plans as well as corporate plans to use an actuarial value of assets that has this smoothing mechanism. For accounting purposes, less common. Uh, and for balance sheet purposes, absolutely use the market or fair, fair value of assets. So I, as I, I do perform another calculation for accounting purposes that shows your, your balance sheet exposure as well <laughs> as the pension expense or the P&L, uh, both of those do use the market value of assets. And I don't have it. I don't have those those numbers prepared in this presentation, but I can pull up the reports and share that with you as well, and we can take a look at the differences. No, that, that that's fine. It I, I think the takeaway is that this smooths out the actuarially actuarial. I can't say that determined contribution because uh, you don't want some wild swings in the contribution that you're expecting. As best right as best we can, it's it's designed so that uh, plan sponsors, you know, have a smoother pattern, have a better expectation of what their contributions are, so there's not as much volatility in in the cash requirements. Okay. Any other thoughts or questions before we move on? I'll just um, add to that a little bit that um, uh, in the footnotes to the financial statements, there's a you go into all the ups and downs of the market. Okay, so as Andre is saying, this is to calculate the a, uh, annual required contribution, but in terms of the gains and losses, you're going to reflect them as deferred loss, uh, deferred. Inflows or outflows, it just gets, you know, incredibly complicated. <laughs> I just wanted to throw that in. Sure. And um, I don't know how many folks on the call right now uh, would recall, but I think about two years ago, off cycle, so I typically meet with the retirement board in October around this time frame, but I think maybe in 2018, I. Uh, was down in, in, in Portsmouth in April or something of that nature. And we focused uh, almost solely on the actual value of assets, uh, how the assets were performing, how the um, how those gains and losses were being deferred and would be recognized in the future. So um, you can rest assured that if there are any gains that are being deferred, they will be recognized in the future. As we'll see shortly, right now we're in a position where losses have been deferred and will be recognized in the future. Mm -hmm. So turning on to turning towards the actual determined contribution, there are two components that make up the contribution recommendation. Uh, one is the normal contribution, and that is the present value of benefits that are accruing in the upcoming year. Because there are so few active <clears throat> active members in the systems, that's a very small component of the contribution. The vast majority of the contribution is comprised of the accrued liability contribution. 
Uh, and that is an amortization of the unfunded liability, which we'll review uh, in detail. That unfunded liability is amortized this year over a 16 year period. Um, that amortization period started at 30 and has been stepping down one year uh, for each valuation. So last year it was 17 years, this year we're amortizing it over 16, next year it'll be 15 and so on and so on. Some of the assumptions that we use to calculate the ADC uh, and specifically that are used to calculate the liabilities are the discount rate, which is equivalent to the expected rate of return on assets of 7.25%. You may recall that we brought that down from 8% a few years ago. And as per usual, we've updated the mortality table uh, consistent with the IRS's update of, um, of mortality assumptions. So we're using the 2020 table that the IRS has um, has published and is used broadly for corporate plans. We're not reflecting any cost of living adjustment uh, for 2020. We haven't been notified of any adjustment. If there is one, please let us know and we can revise these figures. So we, we always start with a review of the membership in the in the systems that is really the foundation of of the costs the, you know the benefits that are being paid to the members so it's always good a good idea to get a sense of what that membership looks like <clears throat> excuse me and as the the plan is frozen and there are no new employees joining the plans or the systems you'll see that the the numbers have declined steadily so that the total membership has declined from 705 to 686. This is for fire and police. Uh, we currently have as of July 1, 2020, 11 active members. And as I mentioned, we look at two measures of assets really what we what the the adc is calculated based on the actuarial value of assets i'm presenting both here so you can get a a flavor of what the two look like and the what i usually look at is whether or not the actuarial value exceeds the market value and vice versa if the actuarial value exceeds the market value that means that there are deferred losses and those deferred losses will be reflected in future years depressing the the value of assets so as i mentioned this actuarial value is meant not to be biased above or below the market so right now it's above the market when we start to recognize the losses uh, that we've experienced in the market uh, this market value of assets will start to trend down toward, I should say the actuarial value of assets will start to trend down towards the market value and maybe even below the market value at times. And actually when the actuarial value is below the market, that's actually a good thing because that means we've exceeded our assumption. We can see in this the last row of this table, the returns on assets for the, the fiscal year. And again, the fiscal year runes from June through, I should say from July 1 through June 30. So in the 2018 column, these are returns from July 1, 2017 through June 1, 2018. So in the most recent year, July 1, 2019 to June 2030, the returns were uh, just under 5% which I think is actually relatively good given what we've seen in the market during during the pandemic. Can I just, uh, this is Landon, can I just make one comment here? Uh, so Andre said losses several times there, and you know, as you see here, there's there's not any actual losses from a return standpoint. He's referring to loss of our return relative to our expected return of 7.25%. So from a actuarial standpoint, that counts as a loss. Is that right, Andre? 
That, that that's absolutely right. And that goes for both the assets as well as the liabilities. Whenever the actual experience is not as good as we anticipate, that results in a loss. Like, <clears throat> likewise, if the actual experience is better than we anticipate, so you would have gains only if the investment return exceeded 7.25%. <clears throat> so in 2019, we had gains that were being deferred. Good point. Okay, yeah, I just, I just wanted to make sure everybody was clear that these are all actuarial losses, not, you know, real money. Yeah. Our benchmark, uh, if we're looking at it, is 725, correct? Correct. That's our assumption. We assume on an annual basis, and this is over a long, over the long term, right? We know every year it's going to be above or below. We're never going to, well, there may be one or two years where we might hit exactly 725, but over the long term, we're not going right. to hit 725 every year. We're, we're anticipating over the long term, the annual returns compounded will be 7.25%. Hey, Andre, Andre, this is Brian, and, and maybe just a quick other comment on this slide. Um, as, as you mentioned, the end of the plan year is June 30th. So just keep in mind that when you look at the changes, particularly on the market value of assets from, for example, 2018 to 2019, the calendar year 2019 was an enormous year for investment returns, but you don't really get that by looking at this slide. So keep in mind when it says 2019, it's the 12 months ending June 30, 2019. And in that period was the fourth quarter of 18, which had equity markets down 20%. So uh, just wanted to make sure everybody understood that. Okay. Also. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Brian, good point. Any other thoughts or questions before we proceed? And lastly, um, one of the items we do look at, uh, you know, these are the, the returns on the market value, the return on the actuarial value, you know, the smooth value over the past year, July 1 to June 30 is 5.6%. So while, and that, that, that's exactly the point of this. So while the market value returns were 4.8%, we're able to defer some of that and get a return that's closer to our expectation on an actuarial value of assets perspective. And one of the things that I always like to review with the retirement board are, is the cash flow of each of the systems and really why I like to do that is because it the, the 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 benefit payments are so significant for this for the asset base that you will almost always see a negative cash flow and the assets declining and that does not mean that the investments have not performed well actually the investments have to to bang busters for us to um, retain the same level of assets year over year. So over the past year, we can see that the benefit payments, and what I've done is you, you have a, a, a neutral line here of zero. Anything above the line is positive. Anything below the line is, is an outflow. Um, so dark blue line represents the benefit payments, and we've had $22.2 million of benefit payments over the past year the i guess i'll call it aqua green bar represents the contributions and they were 13.5 million and then you can see the the more true green bar which represents the the investment returns has also been positive but despite the the positive investment returns and a significant contribution the net cash flow represented by this transparent red bar is still negative and we've had negative cash flows just about every year uh, every year except for one over the past five and again that is really attributable to the amount of benefit payments that are made out of the system every year very significant in, in, in comparison to the asset base so it's very rare that we're going to see positive cash flows and that's not a that's not a bad thing it's actually what we anticipate 
All right. uh, Andre, can you hear me? Yes. Well, I was just going to comment. Um, first of all, I moved to a, a different, I moved downstairs. And uh, and secondly, I mean, over the long term, the, the, the goal is that the last dollar gets spent and the plan's got zero and we don't owe any more money. So it's going to continually uh, go down over time. Is that right? That's right. So we're going to see the the assets decline for a bit and then we're going to expect them to level off but more importantly the liabilities will be declining faster than the assets improving the funded status of the plan right Thank so if we you. if we just look at it in, in isolation just looking at the assets you know the layman might think oh well we're not getting the we're not hitting our expectations but in reality we are because we're looking at it in combination with the liabilities um and and we can see that here for some reason my screen is flashing but hopefully you can all make this out sorry i apologize for that there we go andre can you zoom in a little bit sure that's a bit too much I'm not That's sure cool. why this screen is flashing. Uh, maybe I will briefly. Oh, there we go. Let's hope not. Maybe well, I'll briefly disconnect and reconnect, and hopefully that'll do the trick. Well, okay. Yeah, if not, Andre, let me know. I can try to bring it up. All right. Pr appreciate that, Tom. So far, so good. Everyone can see the screen again, I assume? Yes. All yeah. right, great. So as I uh, let's move forward. Uh, there we go. Yeah, Tom, maybe you can share. This is sure. uh, a little disturbing. <laughs> Technology will kill you. There we go. It's Tom, it's all yours if you can. All right, can you guys see that now? I can, yes, great. Thank you. So as I mentioned, um, you know, just look, we, we, we don't look at assets in a vacuum because in the retirement program, we have two components um, and it's the assets and the liability. So in this slide it's we're comparing the assets to the liabilities and looking at the funded status the percentage of the liabilities that are covered by the assets and we can see from <clears throat> july 1 2019 to july 1 2020 <clears throat> excuse me the funded status is improved from just under 68 percent to just under 69 percent really good thing uh, I will say the the what contributed most to that improvement was the additional contribution from the pension obligation bond refinancing. Without that, we would have anticipated and what we like I mentioned, we did anticipate that this funded status, not only the assets, but the funded status would deteriorate over the next few years and then start to rebound as the liabilities really declined and were closer to the assets. And on the next slide, we can see another measure of the assets in comparison to the liability, and that's the unfunded liability that we spoke to previously. And that is really just the absolute, the difference between the absolute values of the actuarial value of assets and the liability. So the unfunded liability, when you look at it in this measure, really a, a a market improvement from 77 million to 70 million dollars. So uh, when you look at it in, in that light, um, really strong performance, again, mostly attributable to the contributions, but that's a pretty sizable increase in terms of the improvement in the unfunded liability. <clears throat> Thoughts or questions? OK, next slide, please, Tom. 
And then lastly, what, how does this affect our uh, the, the contribution requirements? So I have the, the, the chart, the two bars represent the actuarially determined contribution in comparison to the contribution that was actually made by the city. You can see for 2019, the contribution made was significantly in excess of the actual actuarially determined contribution. Again, attributable to, attributable to the refinancing, so 13.1 million in comparison to 7.7 .7 million dollars. That additional contribution in 2019 does go towards lowering the actuarially determined contribution in 2020. So we go from $7.7 .7 million to $7.2 million. If the additional contribution were not made, the 2020 actuarially determined contribution would be about $550,000 higher, putting us at approximately $7.7 .7 million in line with the 2019 amount. Thoughts or questions? OK, so now we will turn on turn towards the supplemental system. Again, a review of the the membership. Similar to the fire and police system, the plan is frozen to new participants, so the, the membership is declining year over year from 393 in total in 2018 to 371 in 2020, with 14 active members as of July 1 of 2020. Similarly, a comparison of uh, similar to what we saw under the fire and police system, a comparison of the market value to the actuarial value. The returns are very similar since they're invested consistently. And we do see that the actuarial value of assets exceeds the market value in 2020. Again, because there are those losses, as Landon pointed out, the losses are uh, the investment returns in comparison to our expectation of 7.25%. So those losses are being deferred into future years. The, as noted at the bottom of the page, the return on the actuarial value of assets for the most recent year is 5.5% uh, in comparison to the market value return of 4.8%. So we do get that that favorable treatment due to the smoothing of the actual value of assets. Again, a review of the cash flows year over year, similar to what we saw in the fire and police system. They are negative in every year, uh, whereas in the fire and police, it was negative in four out of the five years. Similar dynamic where the, con the, the benefit payments are very significant in comparison to the asset base. So while we do have positive investments, uh, investment return each year, the net cash flow is negative due to those significant benefit payments. And the, the funded status similarly has improved from 2019 to 2020 from 71% to 73%. And we will see on the next slide, the unfunded liability has also improved from 22.2 million to $20 million. Again, uh, attributable to primarily, I should say, attributable to the additional contributions from the bond refinancing. And lastly, turning to the contribution requirements, comparison to the contributions that were made, we can see the contributions in, in 2019 were just under 4 million in comparison to the ADC of $2.2 million. So that does lower the contribution in 2000 or the actually determined contribution in 2020 to uh, two million sixty thousand dollars. Now, if we were to back out the additional contributions from the bond financing, that would increase 
the ADC by about $175,000, bringing us back to that $2.2 million level. So that brings me to the close or the end of my prepared remarks. Any I have one question before, before we quit. Uh, so 2020, are we currently in 2020 or are we in 2021? Is this, is, did 2020 end in June for the city? Yeah, so I, I think of it as, as plan year. So the plan, yeah, and, and that's the difference between what I refer to as funding and accounting. Accounting is the fiscal year. So it's a fiscal year ending 2021. I report on a plan year basis. In plan years, we talk about the beginning of the year. So this is the, the year beginning July 120 and ending June 30, 2021. So we, so the, the, the city's fiscal 2020 starts in July. Correct. Uh, the city's no, wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. Yes. Uh, what he's saying, um, Andre, if I could step in, uh, 2020 really in your world is 20, 2020 through 2021. This is the IRS view where you, you use the, um, the beginning period, uh, the city's fiscal 21 began July 1. So we're, our 21 is his 20. Is that correct, Andre? That's correct, Patty. Thank you. Okay, because I was like, I thought 2020 was over for the city and you didn't make a contribution is what I was. Oh, no, we, we paid big money. Because, <laughs> yeah. yeah, so, yeah, because here it says, you know, I'm C 2020 and I'm thinking the city's 2020 is over and it says no contribution was made. Right, right. It's just a different so, sense. So of this, this 2020 we're currently in. Correct. Right. So if you look at looking at this slide, the four million is what was made for year 2020. OK. And um, just so you know, his his fiscal 2019 is our fiscal 20 and the city made it contributed over 17 million and we should 20. put going forward the actual you know calendar dates of those years so well, the, the the hard part landon and i can do whatever the group likes is so when we flip back to uh the, the previous page where we show the measurements those measurements are actually as of 2000, as of 2020, right? So that unfunded yeah. liability is as of July 1, 2020. Um, there, there's always going to be a little bit of disconnect, but I can, from a contribution perspective, I, I, I see what you're saying, and if that makes sense to the group, we can change that to be the following year. Yeah, you it's, could put it 2020-2021 just for clarification. Okay, we will do that. You know, that way, uh, because we'll get ourselves turned around the axle very easily if we don't. <laughs> the, the, the only reason I say that is because you're telling me now, but I won't see this for another three months or a year, and I'll forget and ask the same question next year. Sure. And that's what I'm here for, to answer those questions. <clears throat> every, every, every committee or board that I meet with, I say, look, you, you all look at this once a year. I do this for a living, so please ask me any questions uh, because I don't an anticipate folks being, you know, super familiar with this stuff when, you, when, when it's not your day job. Thanks. Sure. Any other thoughts or questions? Very good. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay, I will we turn love, it. We back. love this. <laughs> you're, you're, you're in the minority if you're referring to actuarial reviews, but I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's everything we had on the agenda, but since we have Brian and Jim, could you give us a five minute overview of what's been happening in the last couple months, three months? Yeah, yeah. Happy to. Um, good morning, everyone, and, and Jim, please do chime in. Um, I, I jotted a, a few things down um, yesterday, and let me just kind of give you some statistics. Um, 
you know, the third quarter of this year, um, as you're all aware, got off to a pretty darn good start. Um, July and August, our fund uh, was up, you know, call it between four and five percent each of those months. And it was really just a continuation of the of the bounce off of the, the March lows that we saw in the equity markets, given all the fiscal and monetary stimulus that uh, that um, you know the central bank and and Congress has thrown at this healthcare crisis. Not terribly surprising to us that we've rallied so hard off of those March 23rd lows. Um, September took a little bit of a break um, because there was some increasing concern, I think, around um, whether the next round of stimulus was actually coming. And there's been obviously some developments even. Um, in the first week here of October with respect to that, where, where maybe where the market was expecting uh, something to happen and um, sort of maybe increasingly looking like maybe not as quickly as uh, everything everybody was hoping. So September took a little bit of a pause. We were down about 2% um, in September. But when you look at the third quarter in total, we're up about 7% um just in that quarter uh, and if i compare that relative to our benchmark the benchmark was up right a little less than 6.5 percent so about 6.3 percent so um our estimates are that we're showing uh for we're going to show for the third quarter up about 70 basis points relative to our benchmark and an absolute return of of seven percent um Please don't take this with a grain of salt because th this is just our marketable securities investments, so public stocks and bonds. Um, as this group knows, we have some real estate and a couple of hedge funds. It's much too soon to know how those portfolios have performed. Um, but our public market investments are something like 92% of our total assets. So. Um, so we feel pretty good about how third quarter um, has um, has transpired and, and the results that were able to be generated. Um, if you look then at the year to date period through September, obviously the first part of this year was down pretty hard um, with the declines that were experienced in February and March of this year. Um, so through September, we're showing a positive return of about 4.6%, so right around 4.5%. And if we looked at the benchmark, the benchmark's return was a little bit north of 3%, 3.2%. So for the first nine months of this year, to be able to sit here and tell you we have a positive return, I think is nothing short of extraordinary, given, uh, given where we were in, in February and March of this year. Um, and uh, as um, you, you know, as um, a positive as the as the absolute return was to show a return that is exceeding the benchmark by almost one and a half percentage points is, in our view, a, just a terrific outcome. Um, the the other thing I would say is that contributing to that better than benchmark return were a lot of managers that were able to generate um, excess returns relative to their um, unique and specific benchmark. In fact, if you look, we've got about eight active managers in public stocks and bonds. And over the year-to-date period, five of them outperformed. So there are a few that underperformed, but but by and large, uh, you know, our managers are doing what we expect them to do and, and have, have added value for our portfolio in the city. Um, the other thing I will say, and, and I know we talked about this, I'm not sure within this group, but certainly within the investment committee, as the markets declined and, and were bottoming in March, we, we didn't sit on our hands. We took advantage of the declines and we shifted our portfolio exposures to capitalize on what we thought was going to be this, this V-shaped recovery. And so what did we do? Um, going into the declines, we were overweight value stocks in the US because we thought that relative valuation difference between value and growth was pretty extreme. Um, one of the things that happened in the declines in February and March were that growth stock valuations got much more cheap and so we had the ability to shift that overweight of value stocks and, and have a more balanced value growth exposure. 
and since March, those growth stocks, technology stocks, healthcare stocks, consumer discretionary stocks have really outperformed uh, value stocks. So that shift in exposure has really worked in our favor. The other thing we did was we took a little bit of our fixed income money, which is largely investment grade bonds, and we bought some high yield bonds. And uh, high yield bonds act an awful lot like more like stocks than they do sort of traditional bonds. And so as the equity market sold off and high yield bonds sold off, it presented a compelling investment opportunity for us in that space. So right now we have about 5% of our portfolio in, in high yield bonds, and, and that's performed uh, very well as the equity markets uh, recovered and sort of in tandem, high yield has recovered as well. Let me just spend maybe a couple of minutes on the early part of October here because there's obviously a lot going on. We're getting closer to the election. A lot of clients are asking us, well, what do you think about the outcome? And, and I'll just, uh, a couple of comments on, on stimulus and then maybe a, a comment on um, on, the, um, on the election. Um, as, as you know, um, the White House administration came out a couple of days ago and said, you know, we're done with all these stimulus talks and uh, we're going to wait until after the election to re-engage. And, and that was disappointing for the market, disappointing for us, too. I, I think everybody's kind of feeling that there needs to be something done to, to you know, keep the job market improving, keep the economy on, on solid ground here. Um, you know, that's sort of the uh, it's interesting, the words that are, are spoken. So the market sold off um, after that news came out. Yesterday was pretty strong, and today it looks like it's going to open up pretty strong, too. And the reason for that is because although the administration said no more stimulus talks, there are talks ongoing with aid for airlines and direct payments to individuals. So you can call it stimulus, you can call it not stimulus, you can call it whatever you want, but it appears as though there's some momentum for uh, some additional levels of fiscal money to support people, to support the economy, and, and um, which would be good for equity prices and, and capital markets. So stay tuned on that. We think we're, we're likely to get something here even before the election. But, um, um, you know, it's just the, 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 when, when people talk, you know, they say one thing one day, say something else the other day, and it just adds to, to volatility. Um, with respect to the election, um, let me just say this, and this isn't a political statement. This is just a, um, this is the sort of the realities. I think on uh, one side, you have people that are very concerned about what the impact to capital markets would be from a, uh, from a Biden uh, presidency and um, the Democrats taking control of the Senate. Um, our view is that the base case that's already priced into the market. Um, because as you look at the polls, um, Biden's leading in the polls, the Democrats are uh, looking like they're going to take the Senate. Um, when you look back at history, the reality is, is the market does, stock market does well when Democrats are in power. It does well when Republicans are in power. So um, there's likely to be a, a little bit of, you know, heightened volatility between uh, now and uh, you know the results of the election, but but we don't necessarily have a view that um, if one party gets in power versus the other, it's either good or bad for uh, equity markets. So um, let me just just summing up here: uh, really good, really good results this year, um, and furthering um, the strong results we saw in uh, uh, 2019 as well. Um, and to, to be in a position where we've got positive returns uh, this year, given where we were, um, we, we feel very good about the results. We feel very good about how we're positioned and uh, what's likely to uh, transpire here in the next uh, several months. So with that, Jim, I don't know if you have any other comments or if anybody has any specific questions. I'll, I'll just add, we, we, we certainly get a lot of questions about tax policy and the economy and whether there's going to be a, a sharp sell-off in equities if, if there's a change of leadership in Washington. And, and we've done some work around this question and changes to the marginal and statutory tax policies in our view have little correlation with economic indicators. We actually 
found very weak evidence of a relationship between GDP growth and changes in individual or corporate tax rates. And we, we, these studies um, have gone back to the 20s. So the correlation coefficients of uh, capital gains, um, changes or increasing tax rates is probably around 0.3. And to be statistically significant, we need something around 0.5. So it's really the business cycle that, that dominates um, the performance of the equity markets when there's a change in uh, administration leadership and not tax rates. Any other questions for, for, for me or for Brian? Brian, let me, ask, let me ask you a question if I can. Um, going back to what you and Jim were referring to, if there is a blue sweep uh, this this year, uh, your team does not anticipate any major changes in the way our portfolios are structured. Is that my understanding? I, I think that's uh, that's fair, David. Um, and, and the reason for that is because we we're taking, um, there's obviously a lot of rhetoric out there around what may or may not happen from a from a policy perspective but it's our view in that a lot of the things that uh, the biden platform suggests are very much centrist policies i would say um you know in light of that we, is is why a big reason why um you know even if there is this blue sweep um, which to some people, you know, may uh, portend bad things for equity markets. We don't necessarily see that because although there's going to be things like corporate tax rates probably going back up to 28%, there may be some changes in the individual tax code. Um, but, but by and large, he's been supporting more centrist policies. Now, if that were to change and shift, um, you know, we would that that would potentially change our outlook and and cause us to to shift the portfolio. But as we sit here today, we we don't expect that um, to happen. Certainly, um, certainly in the near term. Right. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Keep in mind also, if there's a if there's a blue sweep, there's likely to be a much much more substantial next round of stimulus, and that's part of what. Um, I think is causing an equity rally as, as, as we speak the last couple of days, okay. much more substantial. And our taxes will go up. Offsetting that is taxes will likely go up at the corporate level and individuals, but probably not uh, to the degree that's been discussed um, yeah. in debates. Yeah, yeah. I guess it, the, uh, they're going to go up regardless at this point. I, I think that's I think that's right, Patty. I think as we look out over, you know, the next decades, regardless of who's in power, taxes are going to go up. Yeah, they have to. Yeah. When our deficits equal or exceed 100% of GDP, one thing we can count on looking back at history at almost every country in the world is that tax rates go up. Yeah. On that gap. Okay. Forward to, huh? Yeah. Do Roth IRAs only. <laughs> <laughs> Re okay. Realize your capital gains this year. Yeah. Perhaps. Might as well. Hey, hey Patty, just a um, quick question out of curiosity. I was wondering if there was any progress in the um, filling of the open retirement board seat? <clears throat> uh, I checked with the city clerk and um, nothing has happened as yet. And I, you know, I don't want to speak out of turn, but um, I think if you have any suggestions to pass them along to Mr. Glover and um, they will consider them. Patty, do you, Patty, do you know, uh, I thought, I thought, Shannon Glover had to step off council to run for mayor. Is he still on council? Um, you know, I don't know. Mimi, you, you've been to council lately. He's still there. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, every city is okay. a little different uh, when that, th in that regard. 
OK. And Mr. Challenger could speak to it better than any of us, so. He's still on council. Yeah. OK. But so stay tuned. It'll all be over in a month. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, one Thanks thing. Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, one thing, uh, the, the board of directors is seven members, not five. I think I heard that earlier. Um, and the other thing I wanted to make sure we, we were aware of, typically we do a presentation to uh, city council. Um, yes. And it's generally right after um, uh, the meeting we just had today. But my understanding is that that presentation um, will not be a joint meeting, but just a presentation that will be probably in January of 2021. Yeah, thank you, I Mr. Heads up. Yeah, I was been thinking about that too. Um, and January would actually work, I think, um, logistically and for uh, the finance department, given where we are with staffing. <laughs> so I think we did it in early December last year because uh, I was here and, and uh, helped help get that to happen. But yeah, council would want to know, and it'll be a virtual meeting, so no one has to travel or anything. Okay. Landon? I don't have anything else. If we want to uh, end the meeting. Yeah, we're, I think we're uh, planning on uh, a meeting next month so that uh, they can review I think the market status a little more completely. So. Yeah, we'll we'll have our report uh, in early November. So um, you know, it's going to be the first Thursday or the second Thursday. We'll be ready to go. Yeah, second Thursday. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Well, well thank you, everybody. The president is, but what the heck? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah. Well, thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you.